at our annual general meeting, we uh, mentioned the desire to talk a little bit for it in each talk about what is humanism, what we stand for, and uh, surely Adam's talk will cover that, uh, sure. being the Gay and Lesbian Humanist Association, a key player in the promotion of humanism in the UK. Uh, but perhaps I can just say that definitely we don't have dogmas as humanists, but there is something that we hold sacred, and that's human rights. We are for uh, the right of everyone to flourish, to live a good and fulfilling life. We defend uh, the right not to be discriminated, the right to love. And that's why we are uh, proud as Central London Humanists to have worked in several occasions with the Gay and Lesbian Humanist Association. Uh, for example, last year for the International Day Against Homophobia and Transphobia, with uh, Derek, uh, who is the uh, UK coordinator for that day. And uh, in um, uh, marches for human rights, like the London for a Secular Europe march and the, the protestable campaign. Uh, GALA, the Gay Lesbian Humanist Association, uh, defends and uh, supports the brave fight in countries everywhere in the world where uh, there are no gay rights and actually homosexuality is uh, punished by law even with the death penalty. For example, in Uganda, we grieve the loss of David Kato, uh, who is a gay rights activist who was murdered brutally in Uganda, where uh, especially evangelical groups flying from the United States have been doing eight campaigns to tell Ugandans not to tolerate homosexuals and also that they can be forced to be straight. And of course the result of eight campaigns is rapes and uh, killings. And uh, I look forward to working together with Gala, Central Union, is to put international pressure on Uganda, where they are also discussing a bill uh, named Kill the Gays Bills, bill that is uh, still pending. So in many countries, the fight for human rights uh, is far from over, but in the UK, certainly many gains have been achieved, and uh, uh, there's protection from discrimination, there's uh, civil partnership that gives uh, the same rights, even though it's still uh, second class compared to proper marriage. Um, but yeah, important gain. So uh, the question is now, what next for uh, the advancement of human rights and uh, in general, the possibilities for the future? So I look forward to hearing for, to uh, Adam's talk tonight. Adam uh, grew up in Manchester, studied international relations and uh, uh, works in digital marketing. Uh, his recent work uh, includes uh, work for the BBC and the Five Live. The Gala, yeah. yeah. For Gala, yeah. He's the chair of the Gay and Lesbian Women's Association, elected generally last year. Yeah. And his mission is to uh, increase the membership. And no, uh, no. <laughs> no, promote humanism and uh, gay rights is the... The main. Is the organization's aim and my, my aim as the, as the chair. As well. And uh, so it's a pleasure to hand over to you. Thank you very much, Marco. Um, so, um, yeah, well, I'm, uh, I'm Adam Olds, as it says there. That's a picture of me. Um, slight difference between that and this, uh, being three months in India uh, when I uh, grew, grew this. Um, so, yeah, to give a slightly uh, out of date for this Um It was interesting to, um, to go there, me and Slavek, to, um, to India and Nepal. We, we spent two months in northern India, one month in uh, Nepal. And just see, uh, you know, how, how homosexuality is is interpreted differently, is culturally specific, you know, even across, even if you choose a particular slice of time um, here in 2011, you can still visit other countries, I mean, we've already mentioned Uganda, um, but uh, we, we're here in the UK, but if you go to India or you go to Nepal, you see it, you see it interpreted quite differently between the two, by the way, um, and perhaps I'll, I'll say more about that, but um, there's, um, there's a, a few bits of evidence otherwise that I'll pick out from, from a variety of things as we go through. Um, as Marco very kindly and nicely said, I'm chair of the Gay and Lesbian Humanist Association, uh, which is 30 years old, and uh, our website is gala.org. Please visit it. There's, there's newsletters, there's uh, application forms, and you can talk to me about that as an organisation. But today isn't uh, this talk isn't about a hard sell in any way. It's about actually our the mission of the organisation, and and really kind of it's it's relevant really um, in 2011, and and where where kind of gay rights stands, I suppose and where humanism interacts with it, and what, why have a gay humanist association is, is one question I'm, I'm often asked. And I think that um, 
I will, I'll, I'm not going to talk explicitly about what human is, humanism is, but I will um, refer to it in a few ways, and it might give you a few, a few clues here and there uh, that will inform your opinion. Um, so yeah, it, it's the, the Gay and Lesbian Human Association, I think one of my friends said to me on Friday, well, if it's the end of gay, then will that make me the chair of the Lesbian Humanist Association? <laughs> <laughs> As a guy, it might be a bit difficult. I don't know. Um, but um, I just thought it was a fair point, really. Um, but um, I, I, uh, by gay, I do mean LGBTIQ, uh, lesbian, gay, trans, uh, intersex, and queer, uh, is the acronym that's been banded about mostly um, in recent times. It doesn't, you know... You know, those those are the letters within it, the L, the, the B, the T. They are different, and they, they, they have their own challenges, and they have their own specific things. But as, as Gala and as, as myself, you know, I think that the, um, there's a lot of solidarity between those things. And so when I say gay, I am referring to those things, although it's the gay side that I personally know the most about, um, and therefore what this talk is about. Um, so, um, and, and finally, finally on this title slide, not moved past the title slide yet, that's not good. Uh, no, I'll, uh, don't worry, the other ones might be a little bit more brief than this. Um, but in terms of the, um, the, the humanism aspect, as Marco said, really that for me is about human rights. Um, and uh, I'm going to do an awful name drop now, uh, which was uh, Stephen Fry uh, came to the Gala Annual Lunch, uh, not last year, but the year before. And he said to uh, said to me, you know, he said he said to our group uh, on the table. Um, I have lunch with Stephen Fry all the time. As you can <laughs> uh, but uh, he said to us, you know, gay rights, um, gay rights is just about justice, isn't it? It's just about justice. And lots of people fight for justice. Maybe they want black rights. Maybe they want um, any other minorities. You know, it is at the end of the day about justice, and everybody should combine into that, whether they're gay, straight, or otherwise. And that's why gay rights we see them within as, as a subset of human rights. And that's what matters. That's what really matters. If there was equality, actually if there was understanding, I think that's the primary thing that we're trying to get out there as an organisation, that if it, the, 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 the reason homophobia exists, the reason um, you have the death penalty in Uganda is, is, in my view, simply because of misunderstandings actually about what, what, what gay is and uh, what it means and, and how, it, how it's conceived by different people. And part of the, um, the thread of this talk is uh, to show how those misunderstandings or understandings um, shape the societies that, that, that they're in, um, from ignored to illegal, tolerated to integrated. Really, those are my four, uh, those are the four kind of responses uh, that a society might have to uh, the presence of homosexuality in its, in its midst. Um, it can either ignore it and pretend it's just not there. Um, it can make it illegal, which is predicated on deciding that it exists um, and acknowledging that it exists in order to make it illegal. Um, and then it can tolerate it um, and kind of say, well, okay, fine, but you do that over there and don't, don't interact with us, which is, you know, we'll get to it. But when you look at the kind of the, the civil partnerships and, and gay marriage, it is a separate but equal. It's, it's okay, you're weird, stay over there and uh, we'll just carry on with the party over here. And it's, it's not an integrated approach. And the integrated is the, perhaps the, um, well, I shouldn't use nirvana I suppose, as, a, as a word, but that kind of sense of, of where, it might, where it might go, where it, there's a potential for it, I think, and it's one worth talking about because I'm trying to look a bit into, I'm trying to look a long way into the past and a bit into the future, um, which is a very um, uncertain thing to do, but um, I think it's a, it's a very interesting thing to do. Um, and that's why I've come up with this um, provocative title for a talk, which I was hoping would fill a room in London on a wet Wednesday evening. It seems to be a reasonable job, um, but it is provocative. And I think, um, you know, uh, I don't apologise for that. I actually think that it's deeply humanist to be provocative, uh, to inquire freely um, and, uh, and, and to ask, ask the right questions, even if you don't find answers. Um, and sure enough, this talk itself may generate more questions than answers. There's a question mark at the end of the title for that reason, um, because uh, there's, there's a lot of uh, things to look at, there's a lot of evidence we can look at, and, and through the next few slides, um, I'm going to give you, make some arguments and give you some of that evidence, but at the end of the day, it's up to you to make your own minds up. Um, my, my kind of assertion or my uh, idea, my theory is that the, the insight that's uh, available from queer culture, uh, as I understand it, 
uh, could be taken up and integrated into society more broadly into the benefit of everyone. Uh, and that would be uh, the, the promised land of an integrated um, <coughs> understanding, of, an, an integrated conceptualization of, of gay. Um, so here we go. Um, I'll press this button and hope it does something. Um, so, here we go. Um, this is uh, what the, the image that appears in my mind when I think of ignored that. Uh, slightly scary image of a lady with fingers in her ears. I'm not quite sure what else she's doing, but um, there she is ignoring something. Um, and um, this is, this is the, the ignored part where there is... Um, it's at the side of society where it's something is going on that, that is not openly acknowledged at all, not even to make it illegal. And you see this in various societies at various times. And in fact, I think this is probably the appropriate bit to acknowledge that um, it would be foolish of me to try and map a path of gay rights from um, ignored to illegal, tolerated to integrated, as if that starts at ignored and ends up in integrated, starting when the first ape was designated a man and then ending in, I don't know, 2,400, uh, that would be naive. I think that actually, when you look at this in any detail, you kind of see some cycles. Uh, you see that throughout history, this, this ignored, illegal, tolerated, integrated is, is cyclical. Uh, you, could, you could, I mean, um, the uh, quotation I have here is, uh, history doesn't repeat itself, but it does rhyme. Um, anybody know who said that? No. Yeah. Oh, come on. I expected better an audience left. <laughs> Mark Twain. Mark Twain. There we go. Thanks, David. Yeah. Uh, I didn't plant him. He said that. That was, that, that was an, oh, There you go. Mark Twain said that. Um, it's not a pub quiz, is it? We'll do that. Uh, no. But, uh, yes, Mark Twain said, history doesn't repeat itself, but it does run. It's never exactly the same. Um, but you, there are certain um, things that do resonate throughout history. And I think um, the attitude of um, societies to gay is, is one that you can see in various, in various ways and being responded to in various ways. Because uh, you could say that, um, that homosexuality was integrated in the times of the Greeks and Romans. You might think that that would be true. Obviously, there's evidence that it wasn't in various ways. But, you know, there is evidence that it was and that, it was, um, that there was an integration um, within that society where a form of it um, was understood and was accepted and was not stigmatized. Certain elements of it were, certain elements of it wasn't. Um, but then you see that kind of ebb and flow um, throughout history. And my point with that is that um, in the language of social science, uh, what happened uh, during that era, you know, four or five centuries BC, um, was, was culturally and temporally specific, uh, which is a horrible way to say what's hopefully quite a simple thing, um, which is that it, was, it, it belonged to that time, it was then, it's not now. Um, and the way that we have gay rights now um, will have some characteristics like that, but in the meantime, other things have happened and, and, and the result will not be quite the same. I don't think that we're going to get any kind of, you know, uh, similar uh, outcomes to, to those other civilizations because <coughs> they, they, they have different starting points. Um, so, you know, you'll, you, you, you see that um, between these four categories of ignored or legal, tolerated and integrated, you see that they, they, they have and flow, you know, that might be cracked down by religions at certain points Alexander the Great might turn up and make it trendy for a while. You know, these, these things um, have happened. Um, so I, but what I'm primarily interested in, uh, the main thread, is what's relevant to us as a group of people sat in a room in London uh, in the year 2011. Um, my assertion is that we've emerged from a long period of ignored, gone through a couple of centuries or so of illegal in the UK. Uh, we're now towards the end of a tolerated phase. Um, and there's a possibility, although it's no more than that, um, of moving to integrated. And my basis for saying that is that um, until Victorian times, there wasn't really a conception of a homosexual. It was all about homosexual acts, which is a slightly different thing. Um, and it's homosexuality, I was saying, was ignored. Homosexual acts were perhaps less, um, less ignored or less, less, less illegal. Um, and that's my difference between um, ignored and illegal, really. Um, just to um, talk about one final point on the, the difference between how you see this in the UK versus other places. We talked about Uganda, but, uh, you know, I mean, you could choose a million examples. I, I chose, you see this thread being rerun, even, even if you 
fix the time you choose 2011, you can still see different, different countries being at different points in their evolution, if you want to think of it that way, although there's always the risk that it will revert back to you know what. Um, but um, President uh, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad said in 2007, uh, in Iran we don't have homosexual, homosexuals like in your country, we do not have this phenomenon. I do not know who has told you we have it. Uh, you know, perhaps it was the gay people in Iran that told us, uh, Mr. <laughs> Mahmoud, but, um, you know, uh, he, he, he just made this, this sweeping statement that gays do not exist. Uh, and that's very much in the ignored section. Uh, and that's in Iran in, in 2000. Well, well perhaps he killed them all. Well, yes. We, perhaps, well, I'm sure he'd like to, actually. Um, which brings you to the contradiction um, within that, that although he's saying gays don't exist, He's then making laws that say they can be executed. So how is it possible to execute someone that doesn't exist? I mean, it's, it's to a humanist with a logical sort of mind, it seems like a crazy state of affairs. And indeed, it is a crazy state of affairs. Um, you know, so, so you're right. De facto, um, in Iran, it's actually illegal, not ignored. But, but you have this, this, this president saying, you know, no, it just, it just doesn't exist. You just, it, it's almost as if he just can't fit this idea into his head. You know, he, just, he, he, he tried once, didn't go very well. And he's decided to give up, um, and uh, and and unfortunately, he's in a, power, in a in a position of great power over a, over a lot of people. And yes, the situation in Iran, the situation in Uganda, the situation in many places internationally, is um, is not very good. You know, and it just just as a humanist, <laughs> you, you look at that stuff and you go, well, this isn't right. You know, this is something we've got to, you know, ignored is not helpful to people generally, um, and and illegal is is even more dangerous, perhaps. Um, but really, my, my argument is that, that the only thing that's stable is, is an integrated approach. So, I'll move on. <clears throat> There's a uh, an image of an almighty gavel of just coming down on some matter or other. Can everybody see me, by the way? I, I, I'd stand up, except my, mo my notes are here, so I'm not going to. Um, but I hope you can hear me at the back. Is everybody OK? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah good. A oh, couple of thumbs up. Great. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, this, this, this represents making something illegal. I, I know my lead Oscar Wilde, uh, make him illegal. I don't know. Um, and this was where... Um, uh, well, some things were made illegal at some point in various societies, but again, focusing just on the UK, um, you know, there's a couple of examples that, that, that involved us. In 1265, uh, Thomas Aquinas argued that sodomy is second only to murder in the ranking of sins. That's Thomas Aquinas. I think Thomas Aquinas was actually quite a, a quite a good thinker in many respects, actually, but um, obviously having a bad day that day. But um, it's nicer that they rank sins as well, isn't it? It's nicer them to give us a clear. You know, it's, it's not some, uh, some yeah hierarchy of sin. You know, choose where you want to be. And homosexuality is right up there, by the way. You know, it's really, um, really is quite, quite bad. Uh, in 1533, um, King Henry VIII uh, passed the Boogery Act of 1533. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, in King Henry VIII's Boogery Act, uh, which made all male-to-male -male sexual activity punishable by death. Um, thanks for that, Henry. Um, and, you know, this, this, but again, it's, it's, it's about homosexual acts. The, the, the idea of a homosexual, the idea of a, an identity or a culture even, or a subculture, whatever you want to call it, of gay, was just not accessible to these people. They had no idea. They really had no idea what they were dealing with, frankly. And, um, you know, what I would say is that um, since the swinging 60s, we've seen more of an idea of that uh, become available. And it's become, I think it's added to added to our lives really and, and, and enriched them. Um, but I think that it's it's interesting that those those acts, just as examples, there's lots of them, you can find them on the internet, uh, the kind of timeline of LGBT uh, freedom if you like. Um, it's interesting that they focus on sex and not relationships. Um, in fact, uh, I would call it an obsession with sex rather than relationships. And this is an obsession owned by the major world religions rather than the gay rights movement, for instance. Um, you know, sodomy, sodomites, Sodom and Gomorrah, uh, these are all, um, this, this isn't meant to be a kind of direct attack on religion, because that's on, it, it's politics as well, but they did play quite a big part in, 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 in this, this focus on gay sex, and that's what they want to be against. As a, for instance, even today, during the Church of England, the, church, the clergy, 
are they're allowed to be gay so long as they're celibate so they can identify as gay but no sex you know it's again it's this really narrow focus on gay sex and of course the trouble with gay sex is um I think it's all about gay sex on the Wednesday uh, evening. Uh, um, the trouble <laughs> with gay sex is that, um, you know, if you want to outlaw sodomy, um, go ahead, but you'll be including a rather large number of straight people. <laughs> and it's just a ridiculous, it's a ridiculous notion, really. Um, and it's an unhealthy uh, focus. And, you know, that's, that's just gay sex. You know, that's basically, you know, gay, what, does it, what do you mean by gay sex? What, what, what can you possibly mean by gay sex? And, and then you ask, well, what constitutes lesbian sex? Where do you draw a line between, you know, when he goes to the swimming pool and um, you have those posters up and it says no heavy petting, doesn't it? Where, you know, where do you draw the line between that and lesbian sex? If you want to legislate about it, this is, I'm not being, um, you know, it's not against lesbians. Um, it's just about, you have to have some conception of what you mean by it if you want to outlaw it. And you, you very quickly, whenever you try, end up um, knitting yourself in loops that just don't make sense because the very thing that you're trying to do doesn't make sense. And yet people have tried and people try to make it illegal. Um, and so, you know, the, the threat to the, ch I think the threat that the church realises, and I use that in the broadest sense, um, the threat isn't gay sex, it's, it's actually gay love and gay relationships. And that's what the gay rights movement, I would say, if it's not, it's not down to me to say, but it's my personal opinion that, that um, it self-consciously is more about love than it is about sex. It's the idea that two guys or two girls can embark upon a relationship and that love can be involved and that there's no social stigma attached to that. That's quite an important point, actually, because although there's a lot of legal recognition these days forced through quite quickly and perhaps accelerated over the last 10 years or so, um, that doesn't mean that, that you, you don't have huge problems with homophobic bullying in schools and that you don't still have um, discrimination of all time. You know, those, that bed and breakfast couple that didn't allow the gay guys to stay at their um, hotel, uh, bed and breakfast, whatever. And, you know, that still is very much present in 2011 in the UK. Um, and you see that when you make something illegal, you bring down that gavel, uh, what arises in response, I think it's quite interesting, Tell me if I'm wrong. Um, I think it's quite interesting that gay subcultures will arise. Is there, are people familiar with um, Polari? You heard of Polari? No. Not it's some, not some, some. Um, um, basically, this was uh, the description of Polari is at, at a time when it was illegal to be gay in Britain, the homosexuals were persecuted not just by the law but by society at large. Polari was a secret vocabulary that allowed gay people to speak openly to each other and identify themselves as gay without attracting public censure. So this, this whole thing arose in, as soon as um, uh, it was made illegal and then blossomed and, and transformed into a whole uh, response to the fact that it was illegal. And you still see echoes of that today, I suppose, in, even in pride marches, you, you see this kind of out and proud, you know, we will, if, if, you, if you try and squash us, then we're gonna respond this way, you know, and it's, it's almost like fight, fighting fire with fire. And you, you can say that that's either helpful or not. Um, but, uh, but Polari was a, was a very interesting thing that, that happened. It was a language, it was a subculture, you know, uh, and it wasn't just like, you know, you had signs and symbols like a pink cravat or, you know, wearing a leather wristband and all these sorts of things that would send off certain messages about what your proclivities were. Um, and that happened during this illegal phase. Um, I've got an example here of Polari, if anybody, I'm gonna, gonna try and say it. Wish me luck. As feely homies, we would douche our riots, powder our eeks, Climb into our bone a new drag and our gildy bats and troll off to some bon bijou bar. Does that make sense to anybody? No, you're doing the Kenneth Williams voice. Yeah. <laughs> if I did. You know, I, if, 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 during I wish I could. Around the horns, we're doing Polari every week. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah, I mean, they, they really took it and ran with yeah. it and introduced it to a much wider audience, of course. Um, and it blossomed for, for decades after that, but not so much these days. Um, Yes, that, that translates as, as we are young men, we would comb our hair, powder our faces, wear our best new clothes and our fancy shoes, and walk to some good little bar. That's what it means. Um, so I think that's interesting that, that, that if you make it illegal, it, it, will, it will respond. You cannot, you cannot, it strikes me that whenever you try and squash it here, it kind of pops out there, and if you squash it there, it pops out here. And that's, that's, that's the, uh, that will always occur, and I think it's fair to say that has always occurred across societies. Um, you know, it seems that people are, you know, often, even today, more willing to die than they are to give up their right to, to be gay or to, and, and, and why? 
because that is about being honest. It's about being, first of all, honest with themselves, and then it's more importantly, perhaps, about being honest with society and saying to the people that they're with, maybe their loved ones, um, maybe their friends, maybe political people, we're here, you know, we're here, we're queer, you know. But just just to say, um, you know, this 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 is me. There's nothing wrong with it. I'm not harming anybody. Um, deal with it. I mean, the, the Stonewall uh, slogan, you know, some people are gay. Get over it. Uh, is a very is a great message for today. I, I think. Um, I think it's one that one that needs to be listened to perhaps more. Okay, uh, just two more slides to uh, talk to you with. Um, what happened next is the question. Excuse me. And that is the um, that is the the picture of the front cover of the Wolfenden Report of 1957. Uh, that, re uh, that recommended the decriminalisation of homosexuality in the UK. Uh, it's great, isn't it, that they've, um, they've put a report on the Committee of, of, on Homosexuality and Prostitution, because obviously these two things should be dealt with together. And I don't quite know why it was the Scottish uh, Department. <coughs> if anybody does, then please speak up. It's a different legal system. Okay. So... You know, they, they were doing research into both countries. Yeah, right? yeah. Okay, that's but interesting. The Home Office brief doesn't run north of Berwick upon Tweed. Okay, yeah. I mean, it's quite, it, it strikes me it's quite a broad um, broad consultation that they did to arrive at the Wolfenden Report. It was a panel of about 50 or 60 people. Uh, they did lots of interviews. Um, and they finally, um, finally recommended that and this is a quote, homosexual, homosexual behaviour between consenting adults in private should no longer be a criminal offence. Um, it found that homosexuality cannot legitimately be regarded as a disease because in many cases it is the only symptom and is compatible with full mental health in other respects. And you know, I couldn't really have said that better myself, you know. Apart from the fact that we're just referring to it as if, as if it could be a mental health issue. Um, obviously, that, that was, it, 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 as, as often these social things are, is actually medicalised um, and put into the realm of doctors who, um, ignoring their own biases, which may be religiously inspired or, 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 or otherwise, um, decided that, that homosexuality is a mental illness and that it ought to be um, made illegal on that basis as, as, as something that, that you could institutionalise people for. And this report was a, was a bit of sanity, really. Um, I think the gay community is broadly very thankful that these guys uh, came out with it and, um, and delivered the recommendations that they did. I think it took several more years, of course, before any, any legal changes took place. Um, but it was a start, and it, it got the... Um, and again, it was leading into the 60s, which I think is, is interesting. Um, historical side note. <laughs> I, just love, I, I just love this stuff. Um, is that Wolfenden suggested at an early stage that for the sake of the ladies in the room, um, they use the term Huntley and Palmers after the biscuit manufacturers, uh, with Huntley's referring to homosexuals and Palmers referring to prostitutes. But they couldn't even mention, you know, <laughs> it's brilliant, isn't it? Huntley's and Palmers. <laughs> yeah, it is weird as well. It is sort of an anachronism of this, you know, you can imagine the way these things took place at that time. It's extraordinary. Huntley's and Palmers. Uh, I don't know, we should bring that back. What do you think, Michael? <laughs> no, no, talk about Huntley's and Palmers. Huntley's for homosexuals, palmers for prostitutes, just two types of biscuit. And it's interesting, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> it's, it's interesting they chose biscuits, because, you know, some people call, it's, are you a fruit, are you a fruitcake, this sort of thing. Um, and, it's, and it is that kind of reference to, to mental illness as well. Um, which is, you know, it just shows the, the depth of that, um, that, that, the way they thought of it, the way they conceived of it. And, but thankfully, they were able to do their job properly and, and came out with that. I mean, just, just to tell you a bit more about what happened next, I mean, uh, in 1973, the American Psychiatric Association removed homosexuality as a mental disorder um, from APA's Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. That's their main document that tells people, you know, it's, it's a strange, docu strange idea in itself, actually, to catalogue the things that could possibly be wrong with someone and put them in a book. Um, but they did, and homosexuality was in it until 1973. And actually it was 1990, uh, which is not that long ago, this is 21 years ago, that homosexuality was um, removed from the International Classification of Diseases by the World Health Organization, um, which is extraordinary, isn't it? Isn't that extraordinary? Yeah. You know, and, and it's easy to gloss over this stuff and assume that, uh, well, gay rights are all right, you know, we've got sort of partnerships and, all the, you know, what we've got to complain about. But this stuff is quite recent. The risk of backsliding is still ever-present. 
Um, and, uh, you know, people, people do need to be, be there to, to kind of keep making those points to the political classes, whether it's the BHA or it's Gala or it's you guys, um, all working together as we, as we did with Protest the Pope and other things, um, to kind of to make, to make these points that it was not that long ago that, um, that homosexuality was in the classification of diseases. And in fact, March, the, sorry, May the 17th, every year, because it's May the 17th, 1990, and, and May the 17th every year is marked by Idaho, the International Day Against Homophobia and Transphobia, which Marco mentioned, and Derek is the UK coordinator, and Gala plays a big part in it. And it's so important that, that that's the reason Idaho exists, to, to mark that day as a, as a key day, you know, as the, one of the uh, global level. People kind of said no to homophobia a bit, um, at least legislatively, which can then lead to some kind of social changes. Um, and once these things were done, um, we entered a, a period of tolerance. I'd call this the period of, um, of tolerance. We're in the tolerated, um, got the right slide, that's good. Um, and, you know, Clary, as, as I mentioned before, it died out um, pretty much for all extents and purposes. It, it had no need to exist anymore, uh, increasingly so. Uh, and that's a good thing, I think, you know, that you don't have to hide it. You don't have to, uh, it can, you know, um, have little cliques and have little ghettos in London, which obviously Soho wasn't, perhaps is to a certain extent. Um, and Manchester, you had Canal Street in Manchester where I grew up. Um, that it had to be separate, that it had to be a dirty little secret, really. Um, that it had to be off in a corner and, okay, we've accepted that you're not harming anybody else, but just keep it to yourselves, please, um, was, was, was the argument. Um, and and that's, that's, that's pretty much the period that we're in. Things are getting better, sure. Um, you know, you can see that changes in legislation has snowballed, you know, gays in the military. Uh, gay adoption, civil partnerships, equalising the age of consent, um, all those, those things have happened in the UK. Um, but, um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting that, that, that we're increasingly tolerated, but is that enough, is the question. And it's not, not as if I'm just standing here and demanding something else. It's actually something I would say out of love for society, to say um, it's going to make all our lives better. This is a brighter future for us if we can, if we can get there. Why, if we can listen to each other, if we can communicate well, if you, we can, as I said at the start, um, take these lessons from queer culture. I think there is, I've not been specific about that, and maybe I'll, maybe someone will ask a question and I'll, I'll talk about it a bit more, but um, I, I genuinely believe that there are some things that, that, um, there's a line, does anybody watch Glee? Yes. You watch Glee, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't watch Glee either, no, she, that was a real answer. And there's a line, there's a line in uh, Glee where the, the gay guy and the black guy, uh, girl uh, stood together and, and they say, um, you know, I'm gay, she's black, we generate culture. You know, mm. <laughs> and it's, it's, you know, it's, it's brutal, but it's, mm. it's kind of, there's a truth in that, there's a nugget of truth in it. Uh, and that's what I mean by the lessons of queer culture. What, what is it that can be um, generated culturally by, um, by this and, and, and what is it that people that identify as straight what, what is it that they could benefit from um, in, terms of, in terms of gay culture as well? And I'll talk a bit more about that. Um, but my question is, is there something beyond tolerated, something beyond that, something that qualified as the end of gay? And this, um, I like this picture because there's a lot of cliched images I could have chosen of, uh, of rainbow flags, obviously the rainbow flag, the symbol of the liberation or whatever you want to call it. But I like that that guy is trying to kind of bring it together. You know, he's, he's literally holding the colours and bringing them together. And I think that that's what the flag stands for for me. I'll, I'll come back to that in a minute. But um, really it's for me, uh, we talked a bit, a little bit about equal but separate in terms of gay marriage. And that was, you know, even that has only existed for six years. That was 2000, 2004, 2005 that that legislation came through. So it's a very, very, very short time scale. Um, but in terms of the evidence that uh, we're at the end of tolerated and to some degree becoming integrated, um, I would say that uh, there's a gay magazine called Attitude Every uh, year since 1996, it's published um, a youth issue um, that, that um, documents the challenges of young people coming out um, and when you read those I mean I started reading them in, in 96 when I was 16 
and they're still publishing them in 2011. But you can, when you review those, even if you just look at the front covers, you see that there is a trajectory of improvement over that time where the, the, there's a difference between think people are coming out younger and younger. Um, you know, it, it's not common for 14 year olds to be gay at school and this to be actually gay with their friends these days. I'm not saying that it's, the, that it's uniform, but it is possible. Um, particularly in the schools that have, um, that have challenged homophobia successfully, such as my local secondary, uh, Stoke Newington Secondaries. Really quite extraordinary, the, the, the leaps and bounds it's made. Um, in, uh, and, you know, they're celebrating uh, LGBT, as a school, as a secondary school, they are celebrating LGBT History Month this month. So February is LGBT History Month, I meant to mention that at some point, and I have, so that's good. Um, so, uh, which is to kind of remind us of our history, but also to, to, to look a little bit ahead. Um, but they've, they've put on a whole program of events at that school, which is, it's just, and, and off, off, off com, what are they, off tell, off, someone's Ofsted. teacher, Ofsted. Um, <laughs> Ofsted. <laughs> Why would a school be monitored by Ofcom? Um, <laughs> they, <laughs> strange. Uh, Ofsted uh, said, you know, they have virtually eliminated homophobia. It is possible if the right people are in the right places. And I assume that there's no gay mafia that's running that school. I assume that there's no, they haven't, we haven't taken over the PTA and forced them to, uh, you know, promote homosexuality or whatever that awful phrase from Section 88 was. Um, you know, they, they, they have done it of their own accord because they think, presumably, it's better for the students, it's better for them as people, as human people. You know, a, perhaps a tiny percentage of which might actually be gay, but maybe they've got something that they can benefit from, from seeing this diversity, these different colours. Um, and certainly if you look at Attitude magazine, you'll, you see that with the, the issues that young people face today. Just as a, one piece of evidence, the, 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 the challenges that they face have changed <laughs> over, over, over the last 15 years have changed. Um, and they still have issues, of course they do, um, but, um, but a lot of the time you, you get young people who have been, they read a lot of the advice on coming out and they expect it to be a nightmare <laughs> and in the end they tell their mum or whatever um, and the response is, oh right, and they just carry on. You know, there's, there's no response at all. They wanted it to, you know, a lot of the time these teenagers wanted there to be to be thrown out of the house so they can make a victim of themselves, perhaps. But um, but a lot of the time, the, the, even from their friends, from their peers, the, uh, the the answer is, well, okay, right, why are you telling me? You know, it's just it's so irrelevant to them. It can be. This perhaps is the best of cases, but it, I've had countless conversations really where that's been the case. Um, where where somebody somebody comes out it might be at work might be at school might be to their family and it is just a non-issue these days um, and I would add to that evidence that's one one bit of my evidence I'd like to see that increase of course and it may be of course that I live in a London bubble I'm, I am aware of that I am aware that we live in London and, and London's perhaps not typical of the rest of the UK even if we're talking about the UK which is not typical of the rest of the world um, but you know, today we have metrosexuals and we have lipstick lesbians. We have straight acting gays. Uh, straight acting gays. We have uh, bromance. We have uh, all these different configurations. We have single parent families. We have, you know, all sorts of different configurations of people and relationships. And I think broadly, it's fair to say that um, that we've become more integrated about all those things, and that we've understood that actually they're not dangerous. They not, will not be the downfall of man. Uh, that actually they 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 add to, to everybody's lives. Um, and certainly across the course of history. Am I okay for time, Mark? I have no idea how long I've been talking. Half seven. Um, I will finish yes. soon. Good. Um, <laughs> if you look across, uh, you look across anthropology, you'll see a hugely diverse range of relationships from polygamy uh, with many wives to polyamory, many husbands, and everything in between, and all these sorts of things. So, so this, uh, this idea that seems to be planted in our heads that marriage is a man and a woman, and it has ever been thus, He's just actually wrong, you know, it is wrong. I mean, even marriage being, um, you know, even if you accept that it is a man and a woman, then it was still previously based on power or wealth or political reasons or, or needing children to sustain the family or work for the family, and it's transformed to being primarily about love. So it has transformed over time, and there's no argument that it hasn't. And really, my, my, uh, my challenge is that, um, that gay is or the thing that lies behind gay is, uh, is it should be incorporated into that as a, as a more holistic idea. Um, but I'm hoping to convey 
with the, both of those examples of um, some kind of a feeling that this is this is actually an exciting time of real change in the social integration of homosexuality and um, and I'm hoping that through understanding it better you might be able to um, have an opinion have a say uh, be involved in it I suppose um, you know in terms what would an integrated world look like well it would be one where gay people probably wouldn't be camp you know I used to get asked this a lot you know I'm I think I fair to say I'm one of those straight acting gays I don't speak in a height I'm not Kenneth Williams you know it's not how I act and most of the gay guys I know don't either you know the ones my age um, you know I know gay guys that go to football they might rear children um, they'll have a garden shed with a lawnmower um, you know it's just it's very I suppose the 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 success for gay rights would be for that to just be fine and it just doesn't matter whether you're gay or straight and and you, you're not defined by all those things other than um, you know the fact that that who you decide to take into the bedroom is just is just none of anybody's business really um, and therefore the label um, wouldn't dictate or limit your behavior from one interaction to the next in fact you wouldn't have to come out because no one will care um, and um, and I think that's real um, just bringing this back to the humanist um, viewpoint I think that um, I wanted to relate this briefly to what you were saying Marco about what has humanism got to say about you know this the place of gay in society and, and where it where it nets out at um, and I think that humanism would say that the, because there is no higher purpose because there is no uh, God-given meaning to our lives I think we accept that generally um, actually as Alan said uh, there is um, there is no um, creed for humanism so it's, it's very difficult to say humanists believe this or humanists believe that but I, I would think that the majority of humanists I know would, would agree that um, it means that there's no higher purpose no good given, given meaning and it's because we, we generate meaning through the relationships we have with other people uh, that that we still have meaning in our lives you don't live in a meaningless universe um, meaning is very real and very important but it's down to us to generate it and own it and, um, and deliver it uh, and I think that's why Gay, gay fits into that really because it's about relationships it's about your relationships with other people and being able to be honest with it you know even if you're beyond your partner it's about saying if i am with you martha uh if i am with you then i'm able to be honest about that with everybody else because surely surely that's got to be a good thing and the right way to run things so uh, you know it's not say there are still issues for lgbt groups um there's still a need for a humanist approach to lgbt issues um, you know, there's still homophobia around, um, and rather, um, to finish off a point that I made earlier, I think rather like it, I, I think of it in terms of a dentist or a policeman, um, if we do our job perfectly, uh, which is to ed educate people and prevent problems in the first place, and my, my analogy is that if a dentist does his job perfectly, he tells you exactly how to clean your teeth uh, to avoid any tooth decay, then you'll never need to go to the dentist and he'll be out of a job, actually, because you'll be taking care of your teeth so perfectly. Um, and if you're a policeman, um, they try and prevent crime, not just punish crime. So a policeman was able, in, a, in this strange utopian universe I'm painting a picture of, to do his job perfectly, then um, he wouldn't be necessary. He, he, he wouldn't, not, wouldn't need to kettle people in Trafalgar Square because he'd have, he'd have preempted it and, and prevented that crime from ever taking place in the first place. And I think, I mean, I'm stretching the analogy a bit too far, but my point is that for gay rights, our, our job is to make ourselves redundant. Um, once uh, gay rights, once we've reached the end of gay, once gay rights, once gay is really integrated in society, we won't need to go on pride marches, we won't need to write, letter, write letters to government, the, there will just be an, in, uh, an understanding in, in, in a bit of everybody's brain in that, in that world where um, the right things are done and justice is served without needing to separate it or ghettoize it or any of those things. And that's what I mean by um, an integrated approach. But until we get there, and um, we are a way off, uh, GALA will continue to exist, and, um, and the BHA, the NSS, and CLHG do work on all these things, and will continue to do so. There's still a lot of work to be done, and um, sometimes perhaps people don't realise how much work, some, you know, particularly internationally, as we, as we said before, but even in the UK, there's still some challenges to go. Um, but I just kind of wanted to give you an idea of where I think, as chair of GALA, um, that the, possi the possibilities are that, th that this thing is possible. Um, and I finally just wanted to say that, that just going back to the rainbow flag as I promised, um, that it's a spectrum of colour, um, it's beauty and diversity, it's a message of integration not separation as this guy pulling it together is doing, it's, uh, it's acceptance and love, it's not tolerance, 
I don't think it, that LGBT people want to be, uh, they don't deserve to be ignored, that they don't want to be tolerated. Um, that would be a very mediocre aim for the gay rights movement to be tolerated. You know, and that's why I sometimes rail against kind of equality. Gays want equality. Well, actually, is that is that the extent of what we want? Um, I believe, believe that um, LGBT people and, and what lies behind that deserves to be celebrated. Um, not some weird thing that other people do, but it's containing a nugget of truth about humanity uh, that everybody, straight or gay or anything in between, uh, can learn from. <coughs> that's my idea. And therefore, um, the end of gay happening is predicated on the demise of homophobia. You cannot... If you want to get rid of gay, you have to get rid of homophobia. That's it. That, in fact, has to happen first, and then gay can, can disappear, as Polari did. Um, gay as a conception, as a separateness, can disappear, but only when homophobia has been completely eradicated. And perhaps the end of gay also implies the death of heterosexuality, um, because you know everyone would have much more of a, an interesting and varied acceptance of themselves, the yin and the yang, you know, the different aspects of themselves um, and bring them out in, 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 in more, perhaps more interesting ways than um, monogamous relationships that last for 40 years in Virginia. So my final remarks are that whether you agree with that or not, as I said, it was meant to be provocative, so feel free to disagree. Um, but I hope you can see that there's an urgent need to form a more modern conception of human sexuality that takes account of the diversity and the complexity of it. Um, it was hard to write this talk and not just have the first slide say, it's very complicated, uh, <laughs> I don't really know where to start, but uh, let's talk about it. I've tried to kind of pick one thread out of it and, and talk about it. Um, but that conception would see past this kind of binary uh, gay straight designation or even a sliding scale um, and, and instead offer that queer culture uh, contains a, a unique insight into being human. And if we can take that up, integrate it, uh, then there's a bright hope. Uh, a bright future and a more honest future um, and this is going to sound preachy but which, which, whether that future is impossible or inevitable it is up to us and it's up to me and, and you to, to just think about it and, and to see how that will affect our lives um, and on that note I'll hand back to Martha, thank you very much